Hello, this is Shane Roberts. On December 6th, I gave this presentation as part of the Kiowa Conservancy's Conservation Matters Seminar Series. The presentation has three main parts. In the first part, I discuss results to date from the predator-prey ecology study. In the second part, I discuss things that you can do in your backyard or undeveloped lot to improve wildlife habitat on Kiowa. And in the final portion, I introduce and discuss some new bobcat research that will be initiated in early 2007. The predator-prey ecology study, which was a joint project between the Kiowa Conservancy, the town of Kiowa Island, and the University of Georgia, was initiated in 2004. The main objectives of the study were to examine the ecology and interactions of a variety of Kiowa's wildlife species with a main focus on white-tailed deer and bobcats. It's important to realize how different Kiowa is and I'm going to start with just a little bit about deer and bobcats in general. Um, white-tailed deer often thrive in human altered landscapes. They're one of the species that actually does better when we break up the natural habitat. Uh, when we create this habitat mosaic of fragmented uh, habitats where they have one place they can go hide during the day and, and lay down and they have areas where they can come out at night and graze on grasses or browse on shrubs. Um, they can, they also exhibit what's called eruptive population growth where they can their population can grow extremely fast and they can overshoot what is called the carrying capacity of the habitat or the ability of the habitat uh, how many animals the, the habitat can, can compensate. They can overshoot that and cause ecological damage, uh, damaging other species that live in the forest understory, and ultimately the deer population then crashes back down. Um, this obviously is not a, a desirable thing for them to overshoot carrying capacity and damage the environment. So uh, often you have to do some sort of management with white-tailed deer in suburban settings. Uh, intensive management is usually not that desirable uh, by the property owners that live there and by intensive management I might mean uh, harvest or sharp shooting, uh, sterilization, fertility control, uh, the last of which we did try here at Kiowa or Jim Jordan did I should say. I came in right on the tail end of that. Um, has issues of its own that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, bobcats on the other, the other side of things are not usually a significant deer predator. That's one important thing to think about when I tell you about the results here today. Um, many other studies of deer fawn mortality in the nation have shown some, they, they have some influence on deer populations, but they're not usually the main predator. They're not, uh, they usually don't have the impact that, that we have here on Kiowa. <clears throat> they also have been shown in one study in California to be a good indicator of the the ecological health of the system because of their moderate sensitivity to habitat fragmentation. Uh, this research out in California looked at a variety of different carnivore species and some of the larger carnivores like mountain lions or cougars uh, were the first to go when an area was fragmented and the, the habitat was disturbed. Uh, other species, other carnivores like raccoons uh, will stay around. Um, for quite some time. You can fragment it to death and they'll still be here. Uh, but bobcats are there in the middle, so they can be used as a good indicator of, of how the ecosystem is, is handling that change. <clears throat> they typically avoid interactions with humans. I know this is uh, somewhat hard to believe on Kiowa, but every, when I say that here, people laugh at me. When I say it everywhere, everywhere else, they, they understand. Yeah, they do, but they don't here. Why do we talk so much about bobcat habitat? Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the umbrella species concept. I've said it before if you've heard me talk. Um, an umbrella species is basically a species that has habitat uh, needs and the size of the areas they need that if you were to protect enough habitat to preserve that species, you'd benefit a variety of other species that fall underneath it. Therefore, the umbrella idea. Bobcats holding the umbrella over a bunch of other species. Um, you know, it's, it's not always the perfect methodology because there are definitely some species that would not fall directly under the habitat requirements of a bobcat. Um, but I think it's Kiowa's 
best umbrella, if we can put it that way. Uh, it's, the, it's the animal that has the most diverse habitat needs and the largest range size. So what were our objectives for this study? Um, we had the indirect data from, from Bobcat Diet on their impact on deer. We wanted to look at it specifically. Um, were, was the Bobcat limiting Kiowa's deer population? <clears throat> was there an influence of habitat on that relationship? Did the fragmented habitat on the island play any role in that? Uh, also Bobcat Ecology. We basically wanted to replicate some of the things JC did and see if there had been any changes in the four to five years between studies and also take a more in-depth look at some things he didn't have a chance to do like habitat use specifically. <clears throat> and then I wanted to use this information and some previous information we have on Bobcat Ecology to develop a methodology that hopefully the Conservancy can use um, to basically rate a rating system for undeveloped habitat. If they had the opportunity to preserve this habitat or this one, which one is going to be the best for bobcats? And that's what this habitat suitability index and model is. So what has been done in the past? Real briefly, uh, Jim Jordan did his master's work here, and in 1998 he put together his thesis. Uh, he was mainly looking at the, the ecology of deer on the island and their health. And, in a, in a very quick nutshell, he found that the deer on Kiowa were healthy and abundant. There was lots of them, but they were doing well compared to other uh, coastal barrier islands in the south. Uh, he also looked at bobcat food habits and found that bobcats mostly ate rodents, about more than 40% during almost all seasons, uh, but they also ate deer, and especially during the spring and summer. And he also found that there's about 30 bobcats on the island using a technique called scent stations. If you've seen the, the, right, the white uh, dots on the side of the road in the wintertime, those are scent station indices. Uh, then J.C. Griffin came along, uh, did his master's project in 2001. He found that the diet was similar to what Jim found, a lot of rodents but also deer, uh, and the abundance was similar. He compared bobcat ecology between what they termed the more developed western end of the island and the less developed eastern end. They basically drew a line right where Governor's Drive turned south of the preserve. That was the line. Everything to the west was the west end, to the east, the east end. He found that bobcats in the west end had larger home ranges and moved more during the day than those on the east end did. And the idea of a home range um, Generally, it's thought that smaller home ranges equal better habitat because the animal does not have to move as far to find what it needs to survive. And larger home ranges may be an indicator of poorer habitat. So there was concern there because there was more development on the west end, of course, uh, before the, the V-gate especially. So there was concern there that the human impact was impacting that, the ecology of the bobcat. A portion of the predator-prey ecology study was an extension of our original deer fawn mortality research we initiated in 2002. From 2002 to 2005, we radio collared newborn deer fawns in the western portion of Kiowa Island. For the fertility control work conducted between 1999 and 2002, the western portion of Kiowa was divided into two areas, a control and treatment area. The control area went from the main gate to the Vandross gate. The treatment area went from the Vandross gate to the new fire station near the start of Ocean Course Drive. Now this division of the island is not necessarily relevant to this discussion, but I left the graph this way to show some differences in bobcat predation we will discuss in upcoming slides. The overall point of this slide is to show that fawn mortality was very high in all years and that bobcat predation was the biggest factor in fawn mortality. Bobcat predation is shown here as yellow bars. Bobcats killed 57% of all collared fawns during our fawn mortality research. In the treated area in 2002, bobcats killed 83% of collared fawns. Prior to the fawning season in 2003, two adult male bobcats died. This may be responsible for the decline in bobcat predation 
you see within the treated area between 2002 and 2003 on the graph to the right. We do not know the influence those two bobcats had specifically, but we do have an estimate on the influence one adult male can have. In the control area in 2004, a single adult male bobcat killed 38 percent of colored fawns in that area. This bobcat died in December of 2004 prior to the 2005 fawning season. Between 2004 and 2005 there was a 42 percent decline in bobcat predation within that area. This slide is a comparison of fawn mortality data collected on Kiowa Island to that collected on another research project in South Carolina. The Tom Yaki Center is a group of three barrier islands near Georgetown, South Carolina. This research was conducted on two of those islands, both of which were undeveloped. You can see that in each row statistic, the values match up very well between areas. This tells me that although Kiowa Island is developed, the interaction between deer and bobcats is currently operating in a manner similar to an undeveloped island. This is very good news and our goal should be to keep it this way as there are many negative social human safety and economic impacts of overabundant deer populations. This is a graph of deer density estimates collected from winter spotlight surveys since 1999. As you can see in 1999 deer densities were about 85 deer per square mile. That would be considered an extremely high deer density and potentially overabundant. Deer density has declined fairly steadily from 1999 to 2004. This is likely caused by a combination of bobcat predation and fertility control treatments, which were conducted between 1999 and 2002. As you can see, since 2004 there's been a slight upward trend in deer density. Jim Jordan, the town of Kiowa Island's wildlife biologist, will be watching this potential upward trend very closely into the future. In 2000, the town of Kiowa Island and the University of Georgia teamed up to conduct a bobcat ecology research project on Kiowa. J.C. Griffin, pictured here in the upper left-hand corner, conducted this research as a portion of his master's thesis. J.C. divided the island into two portions for this research project. The white line shown here in the middle of the map delineates the boundary between areas. All the land to the west or left-hand side of the white line was termed the more developed end of Kiwa, and all the land to the right or eastern side of the line was termed the less developed portion of Kiwa. The colored polygons you see here on the map delineate the home range size of adult female bobcats in 2000. As you can see, home ranges on the western portion of the island were almost three times as large as those in the eastern portion. A bobcat's home range is thought to be directly proportional to the habitat suitability and prey availability within the area. Therefore, this difference in home range between sides of the island could potentially be due to human activities or differences in prey availability between the areas. This map shows data we collected on adult female bobcat home range during 2004 and 2005. The delineation of areas is the same as it was in JC's project. You can see that there are still differences between the more developed western end and the less developed eastern end, although the difference is not as large as it was during JC's project. This is potentially a response to prey availability 
Unfortunately, we did not have prey abundance data during JC's project to estimate the abundance of rodents on the island during that time. We did have that data during our research in 2004 and 2005, and we will discuss that in upcoming slides. Here we see data on adult male bobcat home ranges collected in 2000. Because male bobcat home ranges are so large, the sample size is obviously going to be very small. Therefore, valid comparisons between the east end and west end of Kiowa aren't really feasible. This map shows adult male bobcat home range data we collected during 2004 and 2005. You can see that the home ranges are still very large, although the western or more developed end home ranges are about half the size as they were in 2000. This difference could be solely due to sample size, or it could be a reflection of differences in prey abundance between the time periods. This graph shows estimates of small mammal abundance in five different habitat types collected during 2003, 2004, and 2005. This is the data that we wish we had during the bobcat ecology study in 2000 to make comparisons between projects. As you can see, the highest estimated abundance of rodents occurs in dune habitats, followed by hummock island or marsh edge habitats, then pond edge habitats, and finally forest and field habitats. This map is, the, is an example of bobcat locations for a female bobcat on the eastern end of Kiowa Island. There are four major habitat types delineated on this map. The dark green is maritime forest, the dark tan shrub, the light tan high marsh, and the off-white is frequently flooded salt marsh. All gray on this map delineates development of any kind, including roads, homes, and the yards around homes. As you can see, the pink dots are highly associated with shrub and high marsh habitat types. Based on the previous slide, this makes sense as those habitat types harbor a higher abundance of small mammals. We also monitored bobcat reproduction during the predator-prey ecology study. During the four years, we were able to locate seven dens, which contained a total of 12 kittens. This reproductive rate is at or slightly below the average bobcat reproduction rate, as most bobcat dens will have two to three kittens per den. We also monitored mortality. Two of our 16 radio collared bobcats were killed during 2004 and 2005. This 12.5 percent mortality rate is fairly high, but should be offset as long as reproductive rate stays adequate. During four 24-hour monitoring sessions, we monitored bobcat movement rates to compare to data collected by J.C. Griffin. Female bobcats moved a similar amount between 2000 and our data in 2004 and 5, at about 125 meters per hour. Our males in 2004 and 2005 moved less than those JC monitored in 2000, with our males moving approximately 175 meters per hour compared to the 315 meters per hour that JC's bobcats moved. Now this could be due entirely to sample size. As I mentioned before, uh, adult males, we have a fairly small sample size of adult males. It could also be due to one east end male that we think was a transient male. And transient male basically means that it's a male that moved into an area but doesn't have a determined home range. Often their movement rates will be somewhat uh, atypical when compared to other males. 
He didn't move very much at all, and he could be biasing our movement rate estimates down. This could also be another indicator of differences in food abundance between the years. With males in 2004 and 5, having to move smaller distances to find enough food to survive. Now the two male bobcats that died during our project, their home ranges were filled fairly quickly by two juvenile males that we radio collared in 2004. This is good news for Kiowa Island as gaps in bobcat home ranges seem to be filled fairly quickly. We also monitored five gray foxes during 2004 and 2005. Overall, gray foxes tended to use developed areas more frequently than bobcats did. Gray foxes would often den and spend their daytimes underneath villa complexes. We saw a high mortality rate among gray foxes. Two of our five collared foxes died. One was killed by a bobcat, the other by a vehicle. We're also aware of three other uncollared foxes that died during this time. We found that reproduction was harder to monitor with gray foxes. Bobcats are very protective of their dens and will hold very tight with the kittens as we approach. This behavior doesn't seem to be as strong in foxes as they would flee at the first sign that we were in the area, making it much more difficult for us to find their dens. We were able to locate two dens that contained a total of four pups. One of these dens was in a hollowed out tree stump, the other in a burrow. With help from the KICA Lakes Department, we reinitiated alligator population monitoring as part of the predator prey ecology study. As you can see, there's a declining trend in alligator abundance since 1995. But the good news is, since we reinitiated monitoring in 2003, the alligator population has been on a steady increase. Lakes Department personnel and Town of Kiowa Island's biologists will continue to monitor this into the future. Graduating seniors at the University of Georgia's Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources are required to conduct a senior thesis project. We were lucky enough to have two of these undergraduate researchers help us with some analysis on the predator-prey ecology study. They recently gave their senior thesis project presentations, and I'm going to give a brief overview of each presentation now. I will start with Lindsay Kirkman, who looked at the genetic characteristics of the bobcat population on Kiowa Island. There were three main objectives to Lindsay's genetic research. First of all, she wanted to describe the genetic composition of Kiowa's bobcat population. Second, she wanted to compare Kiwa's bobcat population to two other non-island bobcat populations, one in Texas and one in Georgia. Then she wanted to look at the relatedness of individual bobcats on the island and how that may relate to their spatial relationships. The two bobcat populations that Lindsay used for comparison to Kiowa Island were at Ichaway Plantation in southwest Georgia and the Welder Wildlife Refuge in southeastern Texas. Neither of these bobcat populations have been harvested recently and both are thought to be fairly genetically healthy. This table is a comparison of genetic data collected on Kiowa Island to data collected on the two comparison study sites. N is simply the number of samples analyzed. K is the average number of alleles per locus. A is a measure called allelic diversity. 
mean HO is observed heterozygosity, mean HE is expected heterozygosity. Now these four statistics, K, A, HO, and HE, are ways that you can evaluate genetic diversity within a population. As you can see, the numbers for Kiowa Island match up fairly similarly to both the comparison populations. Only in allelic diversity is Kiowa significantly lower than the other two populations. But that difference is probably not biologically significant. As a very inbred population may have a value closer to three. For example, cheetahs, which are known to be inbred, have an allelic diversity around three. The final value, HWE p-value, is basically a statistical test to see if a population is in what is called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's ba basically a test of inbreeding. The closer that value is to one, the less likely the population is inbred. And as you can see, Kiwa's p-value of 0.856 is actually higher than the comparison population at Ichiwe. The moral of this graph is that the genetic diversity of Kiwa's bobcat population is fairly good. And this is important because a genetically diverse population has a better chance of fighting off disease Lindsay's third major goal was to look at the relatedness of individuals on Kiowa Island. In the following maps I'm going to show you, relatedness values around 0.5 mean that the individuals are likely parents and offspring or full siblings. Values around 0.25 could mean that the individuals are first cousins or their offspring of a mating between full siblings. Any value between 0 and 0 0.2 would be some intermediate value of relatedness. And any value at or below 0 would mean the pair of individuals is not related. You may have noticed when I showed this map previously that two adult female bobcats overlapped home ranges almost entirely. Shown here with the purple and green lines, these females had a relatedness value of approximately 0 0.4, which means they are likely a mother-daughter combination or sisters. These females also dinned within 150 meters of each other in 2004 and 2005. These results are very interesting because in previous bobcat research conducted throughout the United States, it is very rare that adult female bobcats will overlap home ranges. This is likely a sign of high prey abundance within this area. The home ranges shown here on the western tip of Kiowa Island with the pink line and yellow line had the highest relatedness value of any combination of bobcats on the island. The yellow line delineates the home range of a juvenile female in 2004, while the pink line delineates the home range of an adult female in 2004. This was most likely a mother-daughter combination. The home range of the largest bobcat we caught during the predator-prey project is shown here with the yellow line. We found that he was closely related to at least four other cats on the island, including sample 8, which is shown in the red line. Interestingly enough, he had negative relatedness values with the other two male bobcats sharing his home range on the eastern tip shown with the purple and light blue lines. The east end male delineated by the purple line here is the one I alluded to earlier when I mentioned a transient male. 
By his movements early on, we hypothesized that he was a transient male that had moved onto Kiowa Island from an adjacent area. The genetic data tends to back this theory up as the most closely related to he was to any other cat was a relatedness value of 0 .01, which basically means he's unrelated to all cats on Kiowa Island. This is a good sign that new genetic information is being introduced into Kiowa's bobcat population through immigration. Carrie Holcomb was the second University of Georgia undergraduate researcher that helped us out on the predator-prey ecology study. Carrie investigated bobcat food habits between 2002 and 2005. Kerry compared data we collected on bobcat diet to data collected by Jim Jordan and J.C. Griffin during their master's thesis projects. Four major conclusions were drawn from Jim and J.C.'s bobcat diet analysis. Rodents were heavily utilized during all seasons and all years, with cotton rats being the most important rodent species overall. Bobcats preyed on more deer during the summer months Bird predation increased in winter, and there were more birds used on the east end than on the west end, and bobcat diet varied seasonally. During the diet analysis, Carey grouped prey species into one of five general categories. The categories were rodent, rabbit, deer, bird, and other. Other included any animal material that wasn't in one of the other four categories. Raccoons, possums, snakes, lizards, and fish would all fall into the other category. When analyzing scats, Carey would group evidence into one of these five categories. Evidence may be hairs, bones, scales, etc. He then summed the total number of these groups within a season or zone depending on the analysis and compared it to the overall number of groups to get a percent occurrence estimate. For example, if there was 27 total prey groups identified within a season and 17 of those prey groups were rodent, we would say that 63% of the bobcat diet within that season was rodent. This graph shows bobcat prey use in spring 2002, 4, and 5. There was no diet analysis done in spring 03 and winter 03. You can see that the bobcat diet in spring is dominated by rodents, with approximately 50% of the overall diet being rodent every year. Bird and other categories were the second most important with an interesting interaction between the two. It appears that when bird was low, other is higher, as in spring 2004, and when bird is higher, other is lower, as in spring 2005. Deer use is very low in spring because of the way we delineate the spring season. It occurs right before fawning. This graph shows bobcat prey use in the summers of 2002, 3, 4, and 5. You can see that rodents are still the most important prey group, even in summer. Deer use has increased as this is the fawning season. Bird use is fairly unchanged, and there seems to be a slight decline over time in other and rodent use. This could potentially be a response to another prey group abundance. For example, you see an increase in rabbit use in summer 2005. It is possible that rabbit abundance spiked in that year, causing a shift away from other prey groups. This graph shows bobcat prey use in the winter seasons of 2003, 5, and 6. As you can see, 
Rodents are still a major portion of bobcat diet, though they're not as important as they were in spring and summer. Bird and other groups become more important, as there are fewer rodents during the winter season. The deer use you see here is likely bobcats scavenging roadkill deer carcasses. As we have never documented a bobcat killing a deer on Kiowa over 75 days old. The main moral of these diet analysis graphs is that bobcat prey use is highly variable between years and between seasons and when one bobcat prey category increases it often affects another. This is very important because rodent and rabbit populations are known to naturally cycle. On years when rabbit or rodent density is high, it could mean less bobcat predation on deer fawns, which could impact overall deer density. What I have covered here concerning the predator-prey ecology study is by no means a final report. There are still at least two major components of the project to be completed. We are currently using habitat suitability models of bobcats to model how bobcat habitat may change over time on Kiowa with future development activities. We are also going to use some new distance-based techniques to analyze bobcat habitat use at a more detailed scale to really be able to quantify exactly how a bobcat is using Kiowa's habitat. Now I'm going to discuss the habitat needs of bobcats and some other wildlife species on Kiowa and how things you can do in your backyard or undeveloped lot can be extremely beneficial to these wildlife species. Some of you may be wondering why we focus so much on bobcat ecology and bobcat habitat and apparently ignore many other wildlife species on Kiowa. Well, obviously a healthy ecosystem is comprised of a lot more than one single species. But on Kiowa Island, the bobcat acts as an umbrella species for preservation activities. Bobcats require large areas and diverse habitat requirements. So basically, if you're preserving the type and amount of habitat to help a bobcat, you're going to be able to help a variety of other species, including gray foxes, a variety of small mammals, herpetofauna, which is basically a word for amphibians and reptiles, and a variety of bird species. One specific example of this is the painted bunning, who prefers the scrub shrub habitat that bobcats also prefer. I'm going to discuss two components of bobcat habitat that are crucial to bobcats on Kiowa Island. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Habitat Suitability Index for bobcats states that bobcat populations in the southeastern United States are mainly driven by food availability. Basically, optimal bobcat habitat is optimal prey species habitat. Optimal bobcat habitat is comprised of a mosaic of grass, forb, and shrub habitat types. By forb, I mean flowering non-woody plant species. As you can see in the two graphs displayed here, optimal habitat is an area which is at least 90% covered by grass, forb, and shrub vegetation. And of that area covered by vegetation, between 50 and 70 percent of the area should be covered in grass forbs. This creates a habitat mosaic of low plant species and shrub species. If you refer back to our small mammal abundance estimates, you can see that the habitat suitability models make sense. Highest small mammal abundance was found in dune, hummock, and pond edge habitats. These habitats are also the areas you are most likely to find a mosaic of shrub, forb, and grass vegetation types. 
The bobcat habitat utilization seen here in this map also makes sense, as bobcats are more associated with what we've called the shrub and highmars habitats, which are the areas you're more likely to find that grass, forb, and shrub mosaic. Bobcat reproductive habitat is not specifically addressed with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's habitat suitability index models. Those indices were designed to be used in undeveloped areas where they assumed that reproductive habitat would not be limiting. That may not be the case here on Kiowa Island. Bobcats tend to place their dens under stumps or down trees or in very thick shrub or briar patches. The top right picture here of a downed log is an example of a bobcat den site. This map displays another important component of bobcat reproductive habitat on Kiowa Island. This map shows all undeveloped areas on the island, shown in dark green, compared to all areas that are developed in one way or another, shown in gray. The pink dots on the map represent every bobcat den that has been found during all research projects on Kiowa Island. The first thing you will notice about this map is that none of those pink dots are found in small, isolated patches of undeveloped habitat. All of the dots, at a bare minimum, are located in areas of multiple contiguous undeveloped lots. So apparently, patch size is very important to bobcat reproduction on Kiowa Island. It is impossible for us to predict exactly how bobcats will choose their den sites in the future. However, based on our data to date, multiple undeveloped lots and large undeveloped tracts of land are important for bobcat reproduction on Kiowa. The major hotspots of bobcat reproduction have been the spit of land to the west of Beachwalker County Park, Cougar Island, the undeveloped tracts of Royal Beach along Flyway Drive, and the undeveloped portions of the preserve on Blue Heron Pond Road. Based on this data, there are two main components to optimal bobcat habitat on Kiowa Island, the feeding and reproductive components. The feeding component, which is habitats comprised of a mixture of shrub, grass, and forbs, can be found in secondary dune vegetation, high marsh edges, buffer strips, or it can even be created in a backyard habitat setting, which we will discuss in future slides. The reproductive component apparently requires large undeveloped tracts of land where the bobcat feels safe in denning. The Kiwa Conservancy is incorporating both of these habitat types in their habitat preservation efforts. They examine potential properties to look at feeding habitat potential, their location on the island and how that could impact travel corridors for bobcats, and the connectivity potential of, of an area how it connects to other undeveloped properties, and how that could potentially improve reproductive habitat. Now I'm going to discuss backyard habitat and how pl native plantings around your home can be used to improve wildlife habitat on Kiowa. Landscaping for the Legacy, a publication produced by the Kiowa Conservancy, is a great resource for identifying native plants that can be used in a backyard setting. The diversity and interspersion of these plantings is important, as we will discuss, and you will hear me refer to edge habitat throughout this portion of the presentation. Backyard habitat basically is edge habitat. You may ask why backyard habitat is important to Kiowa's wildlife. In the following progression of photos, you will see that Kiowa's environment has changed drastically since 1970. As development pressure continues, the amount of backyard habitat increases and the amount of native vegetation decreases, increasing the importance 
of quality backyard habitat on Kiowa Island. Throughout the remainder of this presentation, I will refer to backyard habitat as edge habitat. Edge habitat is where two distinct habitat types meet. Edge habitat often involves a change in vertical structure, not just a change in species composition. Edge habitats can be natural or human created. Natural edges are typically soft edges, while human alterations often create hard edges. Edge habitats with no transition in species composition or vertical structure are often called hard edges. Hard edges are not very good wildlife habitat. They usually harbor a low diversity of wildlife species. Most residential construction on Kiowa Island creates hard edges. Soft edges incorporate a gradual transition in species composition and vertical structure between two habitat types. These edge habitats are often associated with an increased diversity of flora and fauna species. These soft edges can be easily created in a backyard habitat setting. If the construction of your home has created a hard edge between your property and an undeveloped lot or buffer strip, you can soften that edge with native plantings. An optimal planning scheme would be similar to the Bobcat Habitat Suitability Index model with approximately 90% of the area covered in grasses, forbs, or shrubs, and 50 to 70% of the vegetation being grasses or forbs. It is also important that these plantings create a vertical transition from ground level near your home to higher heights near the buffer or forest edge. This vertical transition will benefit a variety of wildlife especially under and mid-story nesting birds. This is a list of trees, shrubs, grasses, forbs, and vines that can be used to create this habitat mosaic in your backyard. All of these species are described in the Kiowa Conservancy's Landscaping for the Legacy brochure. Most of these species are termed mast producers. Mast is the fruiting body of a plant and many of these species produce a mass that is very important to wildlife. For example, devil's walking stick, though it is a mean looking plant, is a very important winter mass producer. Also, if you enjoy seeing hummingbirds, trumpet creeper and cross vine are great hummingbird attractants. Creating and improving soft edges as we just discussed can be very beneficial to wildlife. But preserving natural soft edges is even more important. If you have natural soft edges, such as marsh edge, dune, buffer strips with intact natural understories, or pond edge habitats on your property, the best thing you can do is leave those as natural as possible. Pond edge habitat is very important to a variety of wildlife on Kiowa. Maintaining a buffer strip along a lagoon on your property can reduce conflicts with alligators and provide habitat for a variety of bird and mammal species. The ARB currently recommends a three foot minimum buffer along lagoons, but a wider buffer would benefit wildlife even more. 
Marsh edge is another very important habitat type on Kiowa, especially to species like the bobcat and the painted bunning. The ARB currently requires a 15-foot buffer between low marsh and property development, but a wider buffer than this would be even better for wildlife habitat. Dune habitats are also very important to wildlife on Kiowa and are potentially the most important habitat type to bobcats. Extensive pruning of secondary dune wax myrtles severely degrades habitat quality by removing nesting and hiding structure for bird and small mammal species. Some of you may own undeveloped lots on Kiowa. It is important to note that not all undeveloped habitat is created equal in the eye of wildlife. As an example, we have the two pictures on the right side. The top picture shows a dense pine stand that has shaded out most of the understory growth. This is not very good wildlife habitat. Conversely, the bottom picture shows a more open canopy forest with diverse understory vegetation. This would be considered better wildlife habitat. Openings in the canopy can be created in any undeveloped lot on Kiowa. Though you should consult with wildlife biologists to optimize these improvement efforts. Natural vegetation succession is the driving force behind most of the differences we see in forest habitat quality on Kiowa. Vegetation succession is the natural change in a plant community over time. Young forest stands, shown here as first tree species, are often dominated by densely packed pine trees. This would be similar to the picture we showed on the previous slide that I called undesirable habitat. A more desirable situation would be a forest similar to forest type 3 on this diagram, with multiple age classes of multiple canopy species. This type of forest would also have canopy openings due to downed trees and lightning strikes, allowing sunlight to penetrate the canopy, facilitating forest floor vegetation growth. If you have a closed canopy undeveloped lot, you can improve habitat quality by removing a single tree or small patch of trees to create a forest opening. These forest openings allow sunlight to penetrate the canopy, facilitating understory regeneration, and creating vertical diversity in the forest understory. Again, you should consult with a wildlife biologist to optimize this effort. Forest openings release or allow to grow mid-story and understory plant species important to wildlife. I previously mentioned mass-producing species these species, along with seed producers like grasses, will often flourish in forest openings. Honeysuckle, greenbrier, yopon holly, and wax myrtle are just a few of the important wildlife species you may find in a forest opening. The dead trees left over from the creation of forest openings are habitat in themselves. If single tree injection of herbicides is used to kill trees, snags are created. Snags are dead standing trees and are very important to cavity nesting birds such as pileated woodpeckers. Creation of snag habitat can mitigate problems between humans and pileated woodpeckers. If a tree is downed in the forest and left on the ground, downed woody debris habitat is created. Downed woody debris is very important to reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, and a variety of birds. In summary, there are a variety of things that can be done to help preserve, create, or improve wildlife habitat on Kiowa Island. Supporting the Kiowa Conservancy can help preserve natural feeding and reproductive habitat for the bobcat. As we discussed, this habitat involves a mosaic of grass, forb, and shrub species along with large undeveloped patches for reproduction. In your own backyard, 
you can soften habitat edges by planting native bunch grasses, forbs, and shrubs that create a vertical transition between habitat types. You can also create or improve habitat within undeveloped lots you may own by creating forest openings. In the final few slides of this presentation, it is my pleasure to introduce and describe some new bobcat research that the Kiowa Conservancy and town of Kiowa Island will be initiating in early 2007. Jim Jordan, the wildlife biologist for the town of Kiowa Island, and Eric Rice, wildlife assistant funded by the Kiowa Conservancy and town of Kiowa Island, will be conducting this new bobcat research project in January and February of 2007. They will radio collar four bobcats with GPS equipped collars. These collars function much the same way as a handheld GPS unit or your car's navigation system. Satellites circling the Earth estimate the location of the radio collar based on the satellite speed, Earth's rotation, and the time of day. These new GPS collars are capable of using 16 satellites for one fix. This increases the accuracy of their locations to about four yards. GPS collars will allow for the intensive monitoring of bobcats on Kiowa. Researchers will be able to examine fine-scale bobcat movements through Kiowa's diverse habitat types. This pilot study of four bobcats will also allow them to examine different logging intervals. Logging interval is the time between locations that a GPS collar takes. Researchers want to maximize the logging interval to maximize the battery life of the collar, but they do not want to do this at the expense of decreased movement rate accuracy. The GPS collar stores and transmits GPS locations hourly. These locations are received with the yellow receiver you see in the picture to the right. After a predetermined amount of time, the collar has a specially designed drop-off mechanism that allows the collar to release to be picked up by researchers in the field. You may ask why is this research important and how does it differ from bobcat research that's already been done on Kiowa? This map shows 24-hour movement rate data I collected from an adult male bobcat in 2004. It also represents the most detailed movement data I was able to collect with traditional handheld telemetry equipment. Stars represent locations. Locations were taken every two hours during a 24-hour period. As you can see, there are long distances between stars, and it is very unlikely that the bobcat traveled a straight line distance between points. This is a problem that will be remedied with the new GPS collar technology. GPS collars will log locations every 10 to 20 minutes, allowing examination of very fine scale movements around the island. GPS collar technology has many other advantages. Since the collars drop off at a predetermined time, they are reusable after a small refurbishment fee. This potentially allows for continuous monitoring of different bobcats into the future. It also potentially allows different logging intervals to be set on each collar, examining both long-term trends and fine-scale movement rates. Much less manpower is needed with GPS collars. I logged thousands of hours to collect the data from bobcats in 2004 and 2005 using traditional telemetry equipment. These GPS collars also have a higher accuracy than I was able to obtain with traditional telemetry equipment. My average error was approximately 12 yards, whereas the average error on this project will be closer to 4 yards. Another benefit is that this has never been done. To my knowledge, 
No project has ever looked at this fine a scale movement of bobcats. I would like to thank you for viewing this presentation today. I hope you found it interesting and informative. As the habitat on Kiowa continues to change, it will undoubtedly be the efforts of concerned citizens like yourself that help to preserve wildlife populations into the future. I would like to thank the Kiowa Conservancy, the town of Kiowa Island, the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia for supporting my research. I would also like to thank the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources for providing all the permitting for this research project. I would also like to thank Justin Kaur, Paul Roberts, Amy Roberts, Ralph Schwartz, and Brad Miller for providing pictures I used in this presentation. Finally, I would like to thank Mr. Jim Jordan, Dr. Bob Warren, Dr. Pete Bettinger, Lindsey Kirkman, and Carrie Holcomb, who were all intimately involved in the data I presented here today. Thank you. On to the, the tool that we developed that hopefully the Conservancy can use um, for prioritization of, of different habitats. So what is the Habitat Suitability Index? It's basically a score. It's a way we can give a habitat a score between zero and one. One being good, zero being not good, or uninhabitable would be zero. Uh, water gets a zero, uh, for a bobcat at least. <laughs> Uh, it, and this score is based on how the habitat provides for what we call the life requisites of a species. There's usually four major life requisites for wildlife, very general concepts. They need food, cover, they need to be able to reproduce, and they need water. Those are usually the four things we consider in a, in a habitat suitability index. Uh, these indices are available for a number of species. A lot of them were developed in the 80s. Uh, for a variety of wildlife, birds and, and mammals and everything else. Some are more complicated than others. Uh, usually they just involve some simple measures of habitat and then some sometimes perceived and sometimes real data to back up how those measures of habitat are related to the ecology of the species. Okay, I know this is a lot of writing, but I'll, I'll we'll go through it quickly and simply. <laughs> this. Original Bobcat Habitat Suitability Index model was developed in 1987 by these gentlemen here uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it was designed for the southeastern U.S. It was, the data came from uh, the Savannah River site in, uh, along the, the border of South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, what it does is it basically uses an estimate of food suitability, how, how much food is that habitat type going to produce as a measure of overall habitat suitability. Um, it assumes that water, cover, and reproduction are met, essentially. If, if you've got a good enough habitat to produce food, then everything else is met, is what this index assumes, which is probably a pretty good assumption in undeveloped areas of the South. Uh, we didn't think it would be that good of assumption in a developed area. Uh, concealment cover may be very important. They, can't, they need somewhere to hide when they're in amongst people. Also reproduction habitat, as the trends we saw in den sites, that they were always in patches of habitat that were larger than two hectares in size. So we wanted to look at concealment cover and reproduction specifically <clears throat> in addition to food. So what these little letters are here, we used this original habitat suitability index as simply our measure of food suitability index, so FSI. And we, we came up with simple measures of cover and reproduction, and called them CSI and RSI. And all this comes together to provide our modified habitat suitability index. So MHSI, so follow all my abbreviations if you can. And basically this is what, I, I've shown this in one presentation before, but this is the original HSI. These are the two simple measures, the amount of area covered by grass, forbs, or shrubs, and then the percentage of the amount covered by grass forbs and shrubs, that is uh, grasses or forbs. So it's the interspersion of grasses and forbs to shrubs is what these two measures give you. And then you've got this suitability index here. And if you saw my presentation last year, you remember I said that uh, greater than 90% of the area should be covered in grass forbs and shrubs. 
with between 50 and 70, you can see it peaks out there between 50 and 70 of this interspersion. So 50 to 70% of it grasses are forbs. Uh, and remember, forbs is just a broad term for uh, leafy plants. It's kind of all-encompassing leafy flowering plants. So here's the habitat map we used again. It looks a lot like the previous one. Has a little more detail to it. I separated roads out from development this time and also separated golf course from open altered because they had some different characteristics. So in this case, open altered only <coughs> refers to places like Night Heron Park. Again, here's, the, uh, here's an actual map of bobcat dens that we located, both J.C. Griffin's project, uh, all the dens that were located between projects and mine. And you can see what I've done here is grayed out everything that's not uh, an undeveloped patch. And you can see that every one of those pink dots falls in a fairly large undeveloped patch, bigger than two hectares. So what we did here, <laughs> uh, we took the, the food suitability component and we estimated it from a, a random locations generated throughout the island. So we, we did those previous measures, these measures, and, and got the score for food. Uh, at random locations throughout the island. We then used our, our cover suitability was simply the percentage of that habitat type that was either forest or shrub. We, we figured those are the only two that can provide concealment for a bobcat during the day. And then we, we looked at reproductive suitability. All of those den sites that I showed you on that last slide were either in a forest or a shrub habitat type, nothing else. They, wouldn't, they didn't select anything else for dens. So what we did is we said, okay, forest and shrub, is acceptable, now it has to be big enough. So we used what's called a moving window analysis. Now this is a zoomed in picture of the habitat map and it's called a raster image. It's, uh, you can see the pixely look to it. Each of those pixels is five meters by five meters and each one gets a value for each of these RSI, CSI, and FSI. Now what the moving window does is it's two hectares in size, the minimum size that we want this area to be it moves across the image one pixel at a time and averages all of the values within it and then gives that average value to the center point. So what it's doing here, you see this is acceptable, this is unacceptable, it's gonna average all those and it's gonna decrease the score of this right here because it's, it's got some unacceptable around it. Only when that box is entirely encompassed in a one, so forest or shrub, would it give itself a one in the middle as the best possible reproductive habitat. So that's how that works. Then we came up with this visual basic program. It's a, a computer program that basically reads these ASCII files, the raster images like you just saw, the pixels with all the values, and it calculates our MHSI based on this formula, which nobody likes looking at math formulas, so I'll move on. Um, it calculates MHSI and it outputs a new raster image for me with those new values in each of those pixels. I'm just going to skip right over this. This is the value, the average values we used for each type. Um, you can see shrub gets the highest food value. Uh, and it's as simple as that for the most part. Now what that did is it gave us a, a suitability rating for each pixel. Now it's real hard to do anything on that small of a scale as far as managing anything and selecting habitats. Um, so usually habitat suitability models, it's, uh, they suggest that you should view it from the perspective of the animal, so at a home range size. And usually they recommend the smallest documented home range for that, that species. So we took our smallest documented bobcat home range, which happened to be 237 hectares from a female up in the preserve. And we did another moving window analysis where there's this 237 hectare it's actually a circle now, moving across the island, doing that same averaging process. So what we could do is get island level trends. That was the whole point of that analysis, was to show general areas of the island that maybe needed more habitat help than others at this point. And then within those areas, we laid a plat map of all the individual lots over and averaged the habitat suitability within that lot to give us a score for every undeveloped lot on the island. So then there's a two-level process. You can see which part of the island really needs help, and then within those parts, 
which lots would be the best ones to try to go get if you could. Um, we're running late. I'm going to skip over this. Th all these graphs are showing you that the, the indi indices that we developed coincide well with Bobcat actual using those habitats. So they are reflecting what they should be reflecting is what I would have explained if I wasn't running so long here. Um, so this is what the type of output I get. This is the MHSI. So this is for each individual pixel it's giving the score. Anything in blues here, 0.5 or above, is optimal. It's, they are the, the habitat locations that have the capability of providing for both for reproduction, food, and cover. They're the, the all three, it basically, is anything above 0.5. Now anything below 0.5, is probably lacking one or multiple of those components. And probably the reproduction component is the one that's lacking uh, because of its area requirement. And as you can see here, uh, the east end is doing pretty well uh, still on blue habitats, the really good stuff. Uh, you can see Little Bear Island is, is pretty blue. And that's a, that's a good spot to be if you're a bobcat and cougar. Uh, up there in the preserve, a lot of good habitat left there too. And, and we see a lot of bobcat activity out in these areas, so it matches up really well. Um, then in our second analysis, where we looked at the, at an island level, this is what we get. Again, when you get into the greens and blues is where you want to be. You don't necessarily want to be towards the yellows and oranges. So the general trend here would be that the, the west end is in the the biggest trouble as far as bobcat habitat on a whole, and that would make sense as where the majority of the development is. And one important thing uh, is these green and blue areas in the west end are pretty much the only areas left that, according to this analysis, have the capability to harbor bobcat dens. They're the, the only spots left on the, uh, on the west end, that is. Now, there's lots of good bobcat den habitat out here. So it coincides really well with every den we've ever found in the western end of the island has, ever be, has either been in this green patch or in this blue patch. Um, five of them have been in this blue patch, one in this green patch up here. Uh, these numbers and the boxes here, just a simple strategy I came up with that the Conservancy may or may not choose to use, but basically just a rating system. Uh, this can be averaged which, within each of these boxes to to show which sections of the island are you know, in most trouble at the moment as far as habitat goes. So as far as recommendations, there's a, a few different ways to look at this. Do you try to preserve habitat in the island that's in the most, or in sections of the island that are in the most trouble right now? Or do you try to go get what the best stuff is that's still out there in areas that maybe aren't in that much trouble right now? So I'm not, definitely not going to say each way that's, uh, you know, in the perfect world you'd be able to choose exactly where you wanted to pick habitat. I know there's a lot more that goes into it than that, so I'm sure a combination of both will come into play. But uh, as far as priorities that I see, um, areas in section one, which are Captain Sam's, and the green portions of five, six, and seven, which is pretty much the river course in Rhett's Bluff. Those are the areas that have the, the most potential still in the western half of the island to support reproduction of bobcats, uh, den sites, and also provide for food and, uh, and cover. Now, it's not to say that the rest of the western end is, uh, should be forgotten about. There's plenty of habitat left in these west sections. 129 of 169 lots that were available when I did this analysis have this MHSI rating over 0.5. So they still have this good potential uh, for bobcat habitat. So it's not lost. There's still, <coughs> there's still quite a few lots in the west half that have potential and are used by bobcats. Uh, but overall, again, uh, large tracts throughout the island are, are going to be an important focus also.